Were the early Christians communists? Today's guest says yes, they were. He backs up his claims in his book, All Things in Common, The Economic Practices of the Early Christians. Economists, they, they love to do this, where they love to try and find every aspect of human life and try and find out how this is actually self-interest and how uh, everything can be boiled down to just uh, different forms of bartering and, and different forms of uh, profiteering. And basically what they're trying to do is just rid uh, the world of, of altruism, of uh, relationship, of uh, moral obligation, of uh, communism. Roman Montero talks Christians and communism. Time now for Progressive Spirit. Stay with us. To call them Democrats is an insult to the millions of loyal American Democrats. They shouldn't be called Democrats. They should be referred to properly as the commie crap party. Senator Joseph McCarthy articulating the difference between good Democrats and commie crats. Would Senator McCarthy have thought of Jesus as a commie crat or Paul or all of the early church fathers? Today's guest makes the case that the early Christians were communists. Among the church fathers, people like Justin Martyr and Tertullian, who in their apologies or apologias, they're writing to uh, outsiders and to defend uh, the Christians. And in those writings, they describe what a typical Christian meeting would be like. And uh, in those descriptions, they talk about a collection and a distribution, and they talk about uh, sharing of goods, that this is how Christians do things. Uh, they, they share with one another, they uh, take care of their neighbors, and they also practice uh, a formal kind of communism in terms of an actual distribution. For the Pacifica Radio Network, the Public Radio Exchange, PRX, and from the studios of KBOO in Portland, Oregon, this is Progressive Spirit, progressivespirit.net, I'm John Schuck. Roman A. Montero spends a lot of time studying early Christianity, Koine Greek, early Christian texts, and the historical context of Second Temple Judaism. He's the author of the book we will discuss today, All Things in Common, The Economic Practices of the Early Christians. Via Skype from Oslo, Norway, welcome Roman Montero to Progressive Spirit. Yeah, thanks for having me. I, I want to begin by just reading a couple of texts that uh, I use now on Pentecost Sunday, but it's not because I use the lectionary texts. Uh, these You hardly ever hear these texts. They just sit there. Here they are. Here's one, Acts 2, 42 through 47. Uh, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. And then in the second one in chapter 4 of Acts, uh, the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul. No one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Now, Roman, in a blog post you wrote uh, for Dandelion Salad on May 8th, um, you, you're kind of talking about your book, and you begin with this sentence, early Christian communities practiced communism. Why is communism the right word for early Christian practice? Well, uh, when I use the word communism, I'm, I'm, I'm using it um, 
describing a type of social relationship. And uh, the reason it's the right word is because the definition of communism, as uh, it's used by, for example, anthropologists um, or sociologists, is basically, if you cut it down to the bare bones, it's the principle of from each according to his ability to each according to his need. So that's basically what describes what the uh, early Christians were doing. And it avoids, if you use communism using that definition, it avoids uh, questions that can uh, you know, distract from the issue. For example, questions of law or property uh, or, uh, for example, uh, political questions, which really don't fit uh, with the early Christian movement, uh, the early Jesus movement. And I've actually, I was, uh, some people told me that I should probably use another word such as communalism or um, uh, something like along those lines, collectivism or something like that, something that doesn't have the same connotations as communism. The problem is, is a lot of those words uh, such as uh, communalism or communitarianism have the idea of a uh, close knit sort of natural kinship community uh, as you'd find like in tribal societies where everyone knows each other, they have the same culture, they speak the same language, and uh, they're united in that sense. The problem is, is early Christianity from relatively early on wasn't that kind of a community. It was mixed. It was culturally mixed. It was um, class uh, mixed with people that were wealthy and people that were poor, people that spoke different languages. Uh, people that had different religious backgrounds and so on. Uh, so I think communism, used in that uh, specific way, uh, the way anthropologists use it, and I use specifically the definition uh, used by the anthropologist David Graeber, and um, that really fits with what these texts and uh, other uh, early Christian documents are describing. And what is that definition he used again? It's from each according to his ability to each according to his need. It's the standard definition. Now, he draws it out a little bit more and explains what that means. So, for example, um, it, it could be any relationship, any social relationship, any social situation where that principle, from each according to his ability to each according to his need, is the driving uh, principle. So... For example, this weekend, uh, I was on a cabin trip with some friends, and we all pitched in to buy the food. And once the food was in the fridge, it was basically open for anyone to take whatever food was there. And it was expected that people would take what they needed to make whatever meal they wanted. I mean, if someone took out of the fridge and you know, put it in their bag to bring home, that wouldn't be considered uh, right. But we all basically pitched in, and when it came time to clean the cabin, we all pitched in to do that as well. That's communism. Or even just uh, oftentimes just general politeness. So for example, if you ask, if you're lost in a city and you ask someone for directions, uh, basically you have a need, that person has the ability, and it's expected that he's going to help you with the directions. He's not going to uh, charge you. You're not going to ask for his right to give you directions because in that situation, in that relationship, the principle of communism holds. So many times when people think of communism, they're thinking like a, a governmental system, a state system where the state controls the property. Uh, or they might think of a sort of a, a, um, a commune situation where they have uh, collective property. But that really only fits for certain types of societies, for example, societies with a state or societies with uh, property uh, laws, that's not universal. You know, there are many societies that did not have a state or did not have defined property laws. So when I talk about communism, I'm talking about in this very broad sense of how people relate to each other. And it's as opposed to things like hierarchy or exchange. In fact, David Graeber uh, says that all social relationships could be broken down to communism, exchange, or hierarchy. And those all describe different ways in which humans interact with each other and the moral underpinnings of how humans interact. So hierarchy, for example, would be 
there's a, a boss and then there's, there's a subject person. There's someone inferior and superior. And the superior one gets to tell the inferior what to do. He gets to make the rules. And so uh, there are certain things that will accompany that. So, for example, if he's, he will dictate what needs to be produced, what will be done uh, with uh, the things that are produced, the goods and services, and uh, that's the relationship. Exchange is basically um, market activity, uh, things like that, quid pro quo, uh, you know, tit for tat sort of situations. And usually that's when two people are considered more or less equal uh, and they want to exchange goods generally at a um, – it's considered to be equal what they're exchanging. And once that's over, the relationship's done. It's a contract-based relationship. There's no lasting obligation as there is, for example, in, in hierarchy where the person in charge um, uh, gets to decide how long the relationship goes, usually. Communism is different from all of those in that it uh, doesn't necessarily take into account uh, rank or equality. It's just basically everyone's expected, everyone has an obligation who's involved in the relationship to do what they can for uh, whatever is needed to, you know, whatever is needed to get done. And everyone's expected to take uh, from the, the common pool or take whatever resources they themselves need. When people think of communism, they're often thinking of some utopia out there or some uh, far away uh, totalitarian state. But really, those sort of relationships are all around us. Uh, many families, most households actually function communistically. Uh, the things in the house are available for anyone who needs to use them and everyone's expected to pitch in, to help, do chores or something like that. Uh, when a lot of friends go out to a, a bar, uh, very often they'll buy each other drinks. And if one of the friends starts trying to keep track of who buys what and calculate the prices and everything, that guy would be considered to be acting inappropriately. He would be acting as though he was in an exchange relationship, whereas the appropriate relationship for that sort of situation would be communism. So uh, I think using that definition kind of demystifies the term communism because it's often used even by people who uh, are p politically radically left like Marxists. It's used in a very mystical way, almost like a, a paradise utopia out there where there is no, uh, there's no state, there's no property, everyone shares everything. But if you think about it the way anthropologists use the term, it brings it down to earth and you can see it everywhere and you can see it really in all societies at different levels. But very often we just don't think about it because uh, of the ruling ideology, which is uh, that basically everything is uh, exchange, everything is capitalism. So, uh, you know, when economists, for, and it's mainly economists that are to blame for this, they will examine all parts of society and assume that humans are purely self-interested, that they want to maximize their own profit, and that they really only engage with other people through contract, uh, that they're trying to get the most out of everyone. They're trying to take advantage of everyone. And that's how they model the world. And that's how many people just think uh, that the world is run or that's how humans act when if you really look around, you'll see that that's not the case at all. There's many examples of uh, all kinds of relationships, all kinds of um, situations and communities that don't function on those terms that are actually communistic. If you're just joining us on Progressive Spirit, I'm speaking with Roman Montero. He's the author of All Things in Common, The Economic Practices of the Early Christians. And so really, when you're talking about communism, you're talking primarily about social relationships. It's kind of what human beings do naturally um, to uh, uh, to share goods, to share um, uh, outcomes, to uh, participate, to cooperate. Now, you uh, really start off your book with the contradiction to kind of help explain this, I think. Uh, did they own property? 
and voluntarily share, or did they actually hold everything in common, as in no private property at all? And it looks like there are contradictions within those texts, but you resolve that by speaking uh, in terms of a social relationship. And when all things in common, what does that mean? Well, all things in common, uh, if you look at the original language, where it's, it's panta koina in, in Greek, you won't really find that in Jewish literature, uh, but you will find it in uh, Greek philosophical literature. So, for example, uh, Aristotle, uh, Seneca, uh, Cicero, uh, Plato, they all use that term. And when they use the term uh, panta koina, all things in common, they're talking about friendship. They're talking about the ideal uh, for friendship. And the idea there is that when you have friends, uh, and these are, of course, they're talking about friendship among upper class people, among sort of educated and virtuous people. But the idea is, is that when you, you're among friends and you have a very close friendship, the ideal should be that you share what you have with one another, that whatever you have is at the disposal of your fellow. And it seems that that's what Luke, uh, the, the author of Acts, was trying to get at when he used all things in common. And there, there are many other clues there. Um, for example, in Acts uh, 4, where he says that they, uh, I think the actual wording is they didn't command authority over their own possessions, but they shared all things in common. Uh, so it, it's basically a, a way of thinking, a, a way of approaching how you relate to others and how you think of your own property. Um, when I, in my book, the way I define communism, I split it into two different kinds. I have informal communism, which is what I was talking about before, which is uh, basically a, a social relationship, how you view, um, how you relate to other people. It's uh, not really any rules behind it, but it's more uh, uh, ruled by uh, or enforced by custom, uh, morality, uh, culture, things like that. And then I have formal communism, which is where it's more intentional, more enforced by rules. So, for example, in a monastery, the way things are run in a monastery usually is communistically. But there are rules. There's uh, regulations that keep that in place. Whereas among friends, for example, taking a trip together or uh, hanging out at a bar or whatever, there usually aren't rules. It's just the way it's done spontaneously. So among the early Christians, uh, there was also what we could call formal communism in terms of a collection and a distribution uh, of goods, a collection and the distribution to the poor, to widows and orphans and, the, and so on, which was quite substantial. And there was the general injunction of how you view uh, your fellow Christian and how you uh, deal with your neighbor. And that is that you should share with them and that what you consider, what you have, you should not consider your own, but should also be shared with uh, your fellow. And uh, the Essenes, another parallel um, first century uh, Jewish sect, did something very similar. And you have, when you read Josephus' explanation of who the Essenes were and what they did, you find a, a similar contradiction because he talks about them having all things in common but then also talks about them giving and receiving freely, uh, not being uh, coerced to give uh, what they have, but that they give it voluntarily. And if you take all things in common to be referring to a property relationship, that doesn't make any sense. So uh, I use the example of the coffee machine in my, in my home. Uh, that coffee machine is common property for me and my wife. It's literally common. So if I gave that to her as a gift, if I said, here, I'm going to give you this coffee machine, that wouldn't make any sense because it's already both of ours. It's both of our property. But if we think of all things in common as a social relationship, then it does make sense that they are giving or sharing uh, things with each other and that they're doing so uh, voluntarily because it's not a property relationship. It's a social relationship. It's how... Uh, they view and how they treat each other. And uh, 
their obligations that they have to each other. And and you mentioned it's voluntary, but it was expected. I mean, if you want to become part of this movement, this early Christian movement, um, this ethic, this way of being, this communism, was was what it was a mark of Christianity. Am, am I right? Let me. I'm, I'm here. Here in the eighteenth chapter of Luke, a rich guy asks Jesus what he should do to be saved, and Jesus tells him, "Well, follow the law." And the guy says, "Well, he's done that since his youth." And then Jesus says, "This. Well, there's one thing still lacking: sell all, the, all that you own, distribute the money to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me." But when he heard this, he became sad, for he was very rich. So my question is, Jesus or the author of Luke? was being serious about this, right? Yeah, exactly. And this is all over the place uh, in early Christian literature. Uh, One example I give in my book is that of uh, Justin Martyr. Uh, When he wrote his uh, first apology, he he talks about how Christians hold all things in common, just as the way Luke does in Acts. But he includes it in a list of things like uh, embracing chastity, dedicating oneself to God uh, as like, avoiding the magical arts and uh, avoiding fornication. And then he goes on to holding all things in common and com- compares that to uh, or contrast that with those who uh, value the acquisition of wealth and possessions. Now they hold uh, things in common and uh, share with everyone in need. So when we hear the word voluntary today, uh, we think about it in, in modern terms. Uh, the modern concept of uh, freedom is basically that you're free to do whatever you want and whatever you pick is just as valid. So, for example, uh, if I decide that I want to dedicate my life to uh, helping the sick and uh, caring for uh, those in need, that's a free choice. If I decide to instead become a pornographer, pornographer and uh, you know exploit women that those are just two equal choices and you choose one that's your free choice you choose the other and that's your free choice the ancient concept of freedom wasn't like that it was basically that you were free to uh, follow the the good the correct end so uh, for example Plato talks about this when he describes uh, Socrates and for Socrates if someone were to do something that was wrong, that was uh, morally objectionable, that would not be an act of free will. That would be a mistake. He'd be going against it. So in that way of thinking, in the ancient way of thinking, the pornographer would not be exercising free will. He'd be making a, a mistake. Whereas the person who dedicated his life to help people, well, that would be uh, real freedom. That would be true freedom. Voluntary in the sense that it's not coerced, but not voluntary in the sense that uh, one would be free not to do so and be justified morally. I'm speaking with Roman Montero. He's the author of All Things in Common, the Economic Practices of the Early Christians, a fascinating look at uh, passages of Acts uh, two and uh, Acts chapters 2 and chapters 4, but also uh, the, really the whole of the New Testament in, in many ways here. So in your book, uh, you contrast uh, this behavior of early Christians with the uh, Roman politics and economics and empire. What were Roman imperial attitudes uh, toward communism? The philosophers uh, had a positive view of communism. Uh, So they they talked about uh, friendship and that friends ought to hold all things in common. Uh, There's, of course, the Pythagoreans who were uh, thought of of actually practicing communism and practicing a, a very strict kind of communism, and they were praised for it. But it was basically limited to the upper classes. So this was uh, a virtuous sort of uh, way of living that wealthy, virtuous noblemen could do with each other. But it wasn't something that could cross class lines. It wasn't something that, for example, a a Greek could do with a a barbarian or a a Greek could do with a a poor uh, Greek or anything like that. This was limited to the upper, upper classes. And the way they looked at uh, the poor really was uh, was very negative. They thought of them as beyond uh, dignity. They, they didn't think of them as having uh, any, any worth. Now, there was sharing 
across class lines. Um, but it, it wasn't sharing in the sense of, uh, of communism, in the sense of that uh, people are in relationship with each other and they have obligations to each other. It was more along the lines of what they called patronage, which is where a wealthy person would give uh, gifts or uh, money to a poor person, a patron, who would in turn have to give back to the wealthy person honor and uh, loyalty and things like that. So basically become almost like that wealthy person's servant. So it was uh, philanthropic in the sense that uh, wealthy people were sharing with poor people, but it followed more of uh, a hierarchical structure uh, in that there was always the recognition that there was a superior party and the inferior party and that the poor were dependent on the wealthy and had to honor that wealthy person. Uh, and it was also exchange in the sense that it was thought to be uh, an exchange of honor for goods, for money. Uh, and so they didn't really have communism in the sense that the early Christians were doing it. Uh, it for the early Christians, they specifically went out of their way to avoid uh, patronage type of relationships. And you find that in um, in the epistle of James, for example, where he makes the point to say that they should not give any special honor to the wealthier ones. And uh, Jesus, um, in his uh, teachings, also specifically says that his Christians should not be like uh, the the benefactors, the uh, those patrons, uh, but rather they should be slaves to one another. So he was specifically avoiding, uh, pushing against that culture of uh, patronage and uh, hierarchy where the wealthy were considered to be more valuable uh, than the poor. And that uh, the poor, if they were going to share in some of the wealth that the uh, rich held, it was made sure that it was recognized that they were inferior to the rich. So uh, really, early Christianity was pushing against that and trying to um, uh, push forward a different way of looking at sharing and uh, how people relate to each other. I'm speaking with Roman Montero, author of All Things in Common, The Economic Practices of Early Christians. This is Progressive Spirit, progressivespirit.net. I'm John Schack. The conversation continues after the break. Roman Montero is my guest on Progressive Spirit. We're discussing his book, All Things in Common, The Economic Practices of Early Christians. This is Progressive Spirit, progressivespirit.net. I'm John Schott. Are you now, or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? Now, I uh, had always assumed that uh, these passages reflected an idealized history. Um, and they never really were practiced, and, and certainly not on a large scale. But you've discovered that early Christians did share all things in common and did it for some time. Uh, what is the scale, and, and how long uh, did they practice this? Well, the scale was, uh, I would say, probably anywhere there were, that there were Christians, you would find uh, this sort of, these sort of economic practices. Okay. Uh, and... There's evidence for that. Basically, in uh, you have, for example, um, in Paul's letters and uh, the letters uh, of First Timothy and uh, other letters like that, you find uh, passages where there seems to be rules and regulations being put in place to make sure these systems don't get or these relationships don't get abused. Uh, for example, it talks about in First Timothy who should be on and not on a list uh, for a distribution. So in that community, there clearly was a distribution that was large enough to the poor, to the widows, that people were 
uh, at least tempted to try and abuse it. And you have other passages, for example, where it says uh, in 1 Thessalonians that those who do not work should not eat. And really, if you think about that passage, it only makes sense if there was the possibility for those in the community to be eating uh, without working, without contributing, which means that there was in that community uh, a sort of communism to the point to where there was the possibility of people to become freeloaders. Uh, you have the same thing in the Didache, uh, where um, there are regulations and rules uh, prescribed to make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, there's other evidence, so for example, uh, outside of the Christian uh, literature, you have people who are enemies of Christianity talking about the Christians from the outside. So we have Lucian, who talks about, a, uh, tells the story of a uh, guy called Proteus, a guy who would go around to different communities and scam them. And uh, according to Lucian, this uh, Proteus would go to the Christian communities and pretend to be part of them, pretend to be a, a leader and a, a prophet, and then he'd basically just live off the community. He would, uh, in fact, uh, Lucian said that he would enrich himself. Uh, that may be an exaggeration, but it was clearly enough. He was getting enough out of it that it was worth his time. And Lucian uh, describes the doctrine of the Christians uh, as sharing all things in common, consider all common property. And he, the way he describes it is in a way mocking them. Uh, he says that they despise all things indiscriminately and consider them common property. And so he is doing that to make them look stupid, really, to make the Christians look stupid. Now, there's no reason that Lucian would be ascribing uh, to the Christians, and this is from the second century, to the uh, Christians this sort of practice, this sort of way of living, uh, if it wasn't true. Because it could be seen as something positive to philosophically minded Greeks who thought of uh, communism uh, as something positive, at least for the wealthy. But Lucian saw the Christians do this, and he thought that he could uh, twist it to make it something negative. So he tried to make it uh, some, to make them look, he might try to make it look like something that uh, made the Christians out to look naive. You also have uh, in the, uh, uh, among the church fathers, people like Justin Martyr and Tertullian, who in their apologies, apologias, they're writing to uh, outsiders and to defend uh, the Christians. And in those writings, they describe what a typical Christian meeting would be like. And uh, in those descriptions, they talk about a collection and a distribution. And they talk about uh, sharing of goods, that this is how Christians do things. Uh, they they share with one another. They uh, take care of their neighbors, and they also practice uh, a formal kind of communism in terms of an actual distribution that was well organized. Uh, in fact, uh, it was said that they uh, would send out actually distribution to those who didn't even come uh, to their gatherings, who couldn't make it for one reason or another, that they would make sure that they also got uh, distributed to. So when you look along the whole um, spectrum of early Christian literature, uh, you'll find evidence of this all over the place, uh, including uh, the apostolic fathers, such as in the Didache and the Epistle of Barnabas, you'll find uh, the same thing, that uh, people should not claim anything as their own, echoing what it says in Acts 4, and that they should share with their brothers and sisters. So the evidence is there. It's, it's there to, to see if, you're, if you want to look for it. Uh, but it's just, if you look at it from the framework of social relationships, it starts to make sense and you can start uh, reconstructing it in a way uh, that I think is, is quite plausible.
Yeah, yeah. Now, some ACTS scholars, and I'm thinking of Dennis Smith and Joseph Tyson of West Star's uh, ACTS seminar, uh, put the book of ACTS uh, into the second century. Um, in other words, so they, which actually in many ways fits uh, with the Martyr and Tertullian and the other books that you're talking about, really is kind of a development then, that they see Acts as primary and historical source for second century Christianity. Uh, do you see Acts that way, and, and would it matter to this thesis? I don't think it would really matter uh, to the thesis, really, because uh, what we're describing um, is is found not only in Acts. So there's right. the evidence for this goes back to the Pauline epistles, uh, which is very, which are the earliest documents that we have. And even within the Gospels, especially Luke, you find uh, teachings that uh, reflect this kind of practice. And uh, so Acts is basically, Acts 2 and Acts 4, basically gives uh, the clearest uh, declaration we have in the New Testament for these economic practices. But there are bits and pieces of evidence all over the New Testament and all over early Christian literature. So really, uh, the dating is not that important, to be honest. Okay, let's. I want to make a connection between these passages in Acts and the Jubilee year in Leviticus, which I've often thought about in the same way. Well, it was a great ideal that never happened. I, and I don't now. Now I'm curious. Uh, if after uh, you know all debts are forgiven and people get their their uh, their property back, uh, what Jesus might have meant uh, by his parables about the kingdom of God? So the connecting the, the Leviticus Jubilee year and uh, these passages in Acts and and Jesus parables. Do you see a connection? Yeah, I do. And uh, the connection is there actually uh, not only in Jesus, but you get it in the Dead Sea Scrolls as well. So, mm. for example, um, uh, among the Dead Sea Scrolls, you have uh, different documents that refer specifically to the Jubilee. You have the uh, Melchizedek documents and the Messianic, Messianic Apocalypse that specifically talk about the Jubilee and tie it into eschatology uh, or the kingdom of God and they use the Jubilee not necessarily as a piece of legislation but as a sort of uh, ideal uh, an ideal uh, to strive for an ideal that is going to be realized uh, in the eschaton and I think Jesus is doing the same thing so in Luke 4 uh, he Jesus quotes in his sort of uh, mission statement that he gives in uh, the synagogue, he quotes uh, Isaiah 61, which talks about uh, the good year uh, of the Lord. And that's a reference to the Jubilee. Now, if you keep, and uh, as we know, the Jubilee was the time when the debts were forgiven, the land was redistributed, all the slaves, uh, the debt slaves were freed. And if we take that Jubilee statement and think of the forgiveness of debts, the redistribution of land, the slaves being set free, and then you continue reading in Luke. You read a lot about debt. You read a lot about um, the forgiveness of debt. And we can often think of those uh, passages, those parables, those teachings as referring to sin. But there's no reason that the people who were originally hearing these messages wouldn't have heard it as debt. Uh, we know in first century Palestine that debt was a huge problem. Uh, a lot of peasants uh, would have to go into debt uh, to, in order to pay the taxes and to pay rents and get foreclosed upon. And uh, so this was something that was on people's mind uh, at that time. And so when they heard Jesus talk about uh, you know, debts being forgiven, uh, that people should uh, forgive other people's debts, and uh, even giving the parable about a, a slave uh, or, a, or a servant who forgives debts of other people behind his master's back, in a sense, canceling debts uh, without his master knowing. Uh, these are all things that people would uh, have taken to refer to debts. And if they were thinking in terms of the Jubilee, and the Jubilee was an ideal uh, that's represented the kingdom of God, that represented how society should be, uh, those would be the terms that they would be thinking in. And I think 
if we look specifically at the, the Sermon on the Mount, I mean, the Sermon on the Plain uh, found in Luke, um, Luke 6, 20 to 49, uh, there are passages there uh, that talk about uh, lend uh, to those, oh no, what does it say? Let's see. Give to everyone who begs from you or? Give to everyone who begs from you, but then there's um, lend and expecting nothing in return. Yeah. So that if you to lend without expecting anything in return. Now, if we take that literally, what that would basically be, if you lend to someone without expecting anything in return, you'd be setting up a communistic relationship with that person. You'd be giving something to them freely, but in a sense, setting it up in a way that they're now in a relationship with you, that they uh, uh, are obligated to you as well. But if you're not expecting anything in return, there's no calculation in place. So it's not like I'm lending uh, you something and then writing down what I lent you and then expecting that exact thing in return, which would be an exchange relationship, but rather it's more of an open-ended uh, lending, uh, an obligation that I'm putting myself under uh, for uh, my neighbor or my friend. So if we think about it in those terms, and if you think about lending without expecting anything in return, if you think of the Jubilee, that's what you would have to do. If the Jubilee was coming, all debts were to be forgiven, well then you would lend without expecting anything in return because the debts would be forgiven. But if we look at Jesus' teachings there, especially in the Sermon on the, the Plain and the, that giving to everyone who asks and lend without expecting anything in return, and you think of what came after Jesus, the uh, economic practices that we could describe as communism, uh, they fit together. That's if we take Jesus' teachings, uh, in a sense, literally, uh, that the Christians thought they should uh, lend to their fellow Christians without expecting a return, that they should uh, give to those who ask and uh, share uh, with their with their fellow. And that goes back even in, in Luke to um, John the Baptist, who said, if you have uh, two coats, and your neighbor has none, well, then you give him the extra coat that you have. It's an obligation. So if we take those things literally, then what happens afterwards with the economic practices of the Christians uh, the, the the communism, the informal and the formal communism, it fits it fits completely together, and uh, not only found in Jesus' teachings, but also in parallel communities and parallel documents such as uh, the Essenes and the Dead Sea Scrolls. So once we start thinking in those terms, it becomes. Um, uh, it makes a lot more sense. Roman Montero, my guest on Progressive Spirit, is the author of All Things in Common, uh, the Economic Practices of the Early Christians. And uh, you, you're you getting there to a point of theology, too, that um, that this was really connected with their understanding of how, how the world worked, how God worked, uh, the eschaton. Can you talk about the theology behind All Things in Common? Right. So uh, Jesus, in the Gospels, uh, basically comes to uh, preach, to announce the kingdom of God, uh, the kingdom of God that's going to put the world right, that's going to uh, restore justice and righteousness. So the, the Christians were expecting God's kingdom to come. They're expecting uh, the, the world to be put right. And so what they were doing was trying to establish that kingdom right then and there, in the way that they could. So uh, they were trying to put into play the principles of the Jubilee, the principles of, uh, of righteousness, of the eschaton that was going to come, in the here and now, while they waited for the kingdom of God to be established. And in many ways, I'm thinking, as we're talking, and I'm reading your book and reflecting on this, um, it really was, to use modern language, perhaps, a communities of resistance, I think, um, uh, to this wealth and inequality gap. Um, they may not have thought it about that. They may have thought it in terms of their own theology or whatever, but are they really, in effect, were that. Um, they were alternative ways of, of being in the world. Um, and so... I want to talk about this a little bit because uh, 
it seems so foreign now to us, uh, modern day Christians. We've separated out, uh, as you're right. Economics is a separate, um, morally neutral kind of realm, which uh, I think you allude to in the book uh, is kind of just created uh, by the rich. Anyway. This whole science of economics, but anyway, so what happened? Uh, did did the rich people just end up running the church, and and so suddenly this uh, these values slipped away? You know, um, to be honest, I I don't really know what happened. Uh, it, it's it, it's uh, I've studied basically up until the second century, but I will say this: when you get to people like Augustine. Um, uh, Augustine, uh, in the whole Pelagian controversy, he starts to get away from uh, how Christians act and how uh, they organize their lives and sort of switches it to more just how, how they feel and how they, they think and, uh, you know, faith and things like that. And he sort of, in a way, makes Christianity safe uh, for uh, the the ideology of the world. Um, one uh, passage, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm quoting this correctly, but uh, the general idea is Augustine says that, you know, if you beat your slave, um, don't beat him in your heart. So don't be angry in your heart. Uh, don't uh, feel hatred towards him. But of course you have to beat your slave because otherwise, you know, you'll lose control of, of your household. So in a way, he's uh, saying that you can have Christianity and still have the uh, ideology of the world because Christianity is just an individual, uh, personal thing. And I don't know if it started with Augustine, but it, it certainly uh, reared its head uh, with Augustine. And uh, kind of a spiritualizing it, right? Kind of like, you know, it's, uh, well, equality. Well, you're equal in spirit or you're equal in the lives of the Lord. But when it comes down to really equality, you know, now there is a difference. <laughs> right, I mean, right. you know, it's... so just one, one thing about that. If you compare that to uh, the, for example, second century documents uh, in, in the uh, epistle of, of Barnabas, he basically says in one passage in the Epistle of Barnabas, uh, and the same thing is in the, the Didache as well. It says, if you are sharers in what is incorruptible, how much more so in the corruptible things? And that's uh, all across uh, the, the early Christian documents uh, and the New Testament. Basically, um, that the incorruptible things, the, the spiritual things, they are tied completely together with how we live our lives in the here and now. And that's also in the epistle of James, where he says that uh, the true uh, worship, the true religion is, you know, uh, helping the widows and helping the needy and things like that. So this uh, spiritualization uh, came later. And uh, I don't know if it started with Augustine, but uh, he certainly made it popular. Yeah, and today it seems uh, what you're saying, which seems so natural, is actually seems so unnatural. Uh, I, I, I be imagined imagine the church today to take this seriously, uh, as they do all kinds of other passages in the Bible, or less or less or more so, uh, to uh, have all things in common. And what you're primarily saying in the end, I think, um, is is actually to care about people. And all of their whole life, that that's what it meant to be a community, that we care about them um, and and actually care about them to put our own resources to use to that care. Am I your brother's keeper? I think you talked about the uh, Adam and uh, uh, Abel and Cain story. Yeah, uh, that's exactly what I'm saying. It's If you think about it, it's really not that radical. I mean, I use the term communism uh -huh. because that's what I feel is – the, the, the correct uh, the term for it, but it's really just care about your neighbor, which I suppose actually in, in this day and age actually is a kind of radical thing to say that you are obligated to care uh, for your fellow. Um, but it, it's, it's basically that we should, that if you're a Christian and you, and you take it seriously and you, you want to uh, look at uh, what uh, the New Testament has to say and what Jesus' message is, is that uh, basically you have an obligation to, to care uh, for your brothers and sisters. It's easy to say that, and you can uh, 
you can say that and say, well, you know, I care about them. But the problem is, is that the ideologies and the, the ways of thinking, um, the market ideology that, that everything is basically uh, a form of, of market interaction. And economists, they, they love to do this, where they love to try and find every aspect of human life and try and find out how this is actually self-interest and how uh, everything can be boiled down to just uh, different forms of bartering and, and different forms of uh, profiteering. And basically what they're trying to do is just rid uh, the world of, uh, of altruism, of uh, relationship, of uh, moral obligation, of uh, communism. This is an excellent book, Roman. Roman Montero, All Things in Common, The Economic Practices of the Early Christians, uh, a, a well-done, well-researched, uh, well-argued uh, book that should change us. Jesus was a communist, Paul was a communist, the early apostles were communists, and we ought to be too. <laughs> I'm going pre- to go preach that. Roman, uh, thank you so much uh, for this book and for being with me today. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Progressive Spirit is heard every week. On Progressive Spirit, you hear interviews with cutting-edge scholars, authors, and activists who have something to say about social justice, human flourishing, and things that matter. I'm always on the lookout for interesting guests. The more non-mainstream, the better. I'm looking for people who are telling the truth and have evidence to back it up. This is serious business, living in the empire run by the deep state. We need freedom of the airwaves and the internet, and we need truth tellers with the courage to expose the lies of the criminals in high places. Thanks to the following stations for carrying Progressive Spirit, WETS, Johnson City, Tennessee, WEHC, Emory, Virginia, WPVM, Asheville, North Carolina, Cutsdown University Radio, Cutsdown, Pennsylvania, KFZR, Fraser Park, California, KCEI, Taos, New Mexico, KZ88, Kabul, Missouri, WLRI, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and KVOY, Norman, Oklahoma, as well as now and then a variety of Pacifica network stations. If you enjoy the show, ask your local public radio station to check it out and consider adding Progressive Spirit to its weekly lineup. Progressive Spirit is formatted for radio and is distributed through the Public Radio Exchange, PRX, and the Pacifica Radio Network. You can also catch Progressive Spirit on podcast. Catch it on your favorite podcast app. And if you like the show, please share it on your social media and say nice things. The website is progressivespirit.net, Facebook, Twitter. I do all that too. I'm also the leader of a progressive congregation in Beaverton, Oregon, Southminster Presbyterian South Min. O-R-G. Progressive Spirit is produced in the studios of KBOO in Portland, Oregon. I'm John Shuck. Be well.